This past Wednesday, President Biden set off for Brussels, where he plans to speak with several key European allies about the developments in Ukraine and what a path forward for the NATO alliance may look like. Just after his takeoff, the U.S. State Department officially recognized Russian war crimes in Ukraine, following reports from American intelligence that Russia was considering the use of chemical weapons and has indiscriminately killed and captured Ukrainian civilians, including children. For Capital Crossfile, I'm Emmanuel Dyer Melado. Thank you for joining us as we continue our special coverage on the crisis in Ukraine. Today, we are once again joined by GW professor Michael Purcell, who specializes in international security policy, Eurasian affairs, and military issues. Professor, thank you so much for speaking with us again. Yeah, thank you. Since the start of the invasion, there's been a wide variety of military developments. Retouching on something we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, it appears Russia has been slowed down. Would you say that is the case? And if so, why do you think that has happened? Yeah, I would certainly agree with you that um, that's a, a, a an accurate general assessment. Uh, they clearly have not achieved, I would say, even their intermediate operational objectives, uh, for example, of taking sort of key cities in the east, um, let alone Kiev. But, um, you know, in a, in a general way, I tend to, uh, having a, a military background, I tend to not pay a whole lot of attention to sort of detailed reports coming out, um, not because I don't care, but because uh, I sort of have built into my um, system of, of uh, cognitive system of, of assessing a situation and, and tending towards thinking about decisions that are necessary in the future, uh, re refer to the old sort of truism amongst military people that uh, the first report is always false. Um, so, you know, we want to sort of look at, you know, a series of information that comes out of, of the battle space and, uh, and then look for sort of the, the, the media in there to find out the truth. Uh, but I think what we, we could easily surmise is that uh, in any conflict like this, um, what's sometimes referred to as the fog of war, and that and some people think of that as being sort of a tactical thing where somebody's shooting at each other. Um, certainly, that's a very intense version of that. But there's also just simply the bureaucratic fog of war, right? The ability to to manage, direct, uh, supervise, uh, redirect, supply, support, um, and coordinate the activities of all these forces on, on such a uh, large number of axes of, of advance right now. Um, that's really hard. Uh, they clearly didn't plan well, didn't rehearse well, and uh, are not performing well, uh, as opposed to the Ukrainians who are on home turf and uh, are reacting very quickly and very flexibly. With that, how has Western aid helped Ukraine hold off Russia's attack? And does Russia have the resources to push through this Western-backed Ukrainian resistance? Oh, any, any question like that is going to have sort of a contingent answer, right? It's how much gets in and um, how much resources uh, Russia is willing to commit uh, to, to, to the fight. Um, I, I would say in general, the, the Western resources are, are essential. You know, uh, uh, I don't know we'd be where we're at at all right now without it. Um, those are key weapon systems, key capabilities, things they couldn't have done otherwise, right? And they've been provided in large numbers. So the capabilities now there and the quantity, um, the capacity to do this again and again and again uh, is there as well. So that's really important. I'd, I'd push you to think about something else, though, as well, that uh, is not quite as visible or as short term, which is the culture of the respective Ukrainian and, and Russian militaries and the effect that Ukraine sort of um, partnership with NATO and the West over the past 30 years, frankly, um, has had upon their ability to operate. And, uh, and this is in the minds and cultures of the units, their ability to sort of, you know, what's the relationship between a commander and a, and a, and a young soldier? Um, the ability to assimilate these sort of territorial defense units of civilians um, and operate effectively with each other. It seems, right, from what we see, the Ukrainians have a very healthy command climate, right, in their military. And their, um, their actions on the battlefield are reflective of a, of a force that's trusting in, in small units to go do things. Um, there's implicit communication and what we call mission-style um, command orders, meaning they're given uh, a desired end state and then allowed to figure out how to best achieve that. Uh, now, this is in comparison to what we see on the Russian side, which is which is not that, right? And anybody who has some familiarity with the Russian military knows they have a, a long history of sort of brutal hazing, uh, very hierarchical, um, top-down, uh, both planning and execution. And uh, we're seeing a lot of Russians sitting around in their vehicles 
in these long convoys and, and being relatively ineffective and then resorting to sort of brute force, uh, which is quite frankly how they they train their folks. Now, they've made progress over the years, but nothing like like Ukraine and and their unwillingness to sort of partner or, or work with uh, Western forces has actually prevented them from achieving the same level of proficiency in the kind of culture that Western militaries have. And, and they're paying a price for that now. In the sense of the use of force, how far do you think Putin is willing to go? And do you think he will resort to chemical weapons like American intelligence suggests he might? Uh, of course, I don't know. I think what the intelligence folks are telling us is that they are, they are picking up on discussions amongst Russian leadership about this, which is, I would think, to be expected, right? And uh, we haven't heard them say there, were, there has been preparation. So we haven't seen physical movement, or at least it's not been made public, right, that there's been physical movement of forces or, or uh, materials that would support something like that. It's not easy to conduct a chemical attack. Um, you have to uh, protect your own people um, and uh, move that material in and around the battlefield. It's, it's very difficult. So I would say, you know, first we should think this is hard stuff to do. Um, I think the greater fear for most of us is, is uh, would be um, a, a willingness to use a tactical nuclear uh, uh, weapon. We've talked for years about this, this idea that the Russians deny, but, but the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review in, in 2018 claimed is, is true that they have a, a policy in place that um, is called escalate to de-escalate. And the idea there would be to utilize a tactical nuclear weapon with a low yield in a, in a small area as a way to effectively um, cross a threshold, pause the situation, and allow for um, maybe a negotiation from some position of strength achieved temporarily because of this, um, but also to, to, to warrant a response from NATO and the US. And in fact, the US and NATO have said, if they were to use a tactical nuclear weapon, the exact words were, you know, everything's on the table, um, which is basically a way of saying, uh, we've now crossed a threshold into sort of global conflict at some level, and it would require a response of, a proportional response from, from NATO and the U.S., and that's, that's of course, um, significant. And as we speak, Biden is meeting with NATO allies in Brussels to discuss transferring more aid, like you talked about. What do you think Ukraine needs the most right now, and how could NATO help in Europe besides providing logistical support for humanitarian operations? But I'll again sort of answer a question that you haven't asked, but, uh, but, but I want to talk about. Um, what I think Ukraine continues to need is uh, alliance support and political support, right? So um, this is that part of the of a, of a conflict where we might look at. Um, I thought, you know, but let's let's take a positive spin on it. I think NA the NATO alliance has been very strong so far, very unified in their political support for Ukraine and, of course, the material support. Um, and that's no small task. There's 30 nations inside of NATO, and it's a consensus-based organization. So alliance politics, um, whether it's now or in World War II. Are always contentious, uh, contentious, always very contingent, um, and it, it it forces somebody like President Biden, who who clearly is uh, leading the country that that's the the, uh, the um, provides the vast majority of NATO military capability. He's still going to talk to the Slovenians and uh, Macedonians, North Macedonians, um, about their willingness to participate and, and kind of rally those those democratic countries together. It takes a significant effort. So who's not doing that? Right? Is uh, Vladimir Putin? Um, and I, I think this is a quick time to look and say uh, for us to go, uh, is Vladimir Putin's vision of how the world might work uh, playing out the way he, he would like it to? I think the answer is no. That authoritarianism, autocracy, uh, autarky, right? The idea that he can kind of run an economy on its own without inputs from, from other, other economies around the world. All these ideas uh, seemed attractive at various times when countries like that were doing well. And uh, they look they look really uh, uh, Poor, have to have very poor prospects at the moment. So what Ukraine really needs from the alliance is continued political unity and support and how that manifests in terms of material support. Um, maybe, maybe we follow up on that, but um, political unity is what they need. And in addition to Ukraine's needs, what do you expect to come off Biden's meetings in Brussels? Um, I, I think probably we'll see, first of all, some some specific uh, uh, promises of, support, of material support that are probably on paper at the moment and are being held for the you know, joint statement that, that, that inevitably comes out of a NATO get together like this. And uh, you know, various countries will wanna highlight their material support that they're gonna continue to provide or, 
or begin to provide to the Ukrainians. And uh, I would imagine that'll ran, run the gamut from um, on the high end. Uh, I think what we'd all like to see uh, is continued uh, uh, help in terms of air defense, um, which is fairly visible. Um, what we're not going to see uh, as visibly is, is cybersecurity and, um, and cyber assistance, which is uh, may, maybe maybe um, you know equally important, but uh, certainly less visible. And uh, and again, lastly, I'd just say again, you know, the, the idea that uh, there'll be a statement that all 30 nations sign up to um, that uh, uh, continue, pledges continued support for the duration of this conflict, whether it be a week, a month, or or years. We've also seen some other proposals, like a Pol Polish one to transfer MIG-29 fighter jets to Ukraine in exchange for American replacements, which the U.S. declined. We've also heard talks of compelling Turkey to transfer its stockpile of Russian air defense missiles to Ukraine. How important are these armed transfers to the Ukrainian resistance efforts? I, I personally, and this is just based on my operational background, I'm more interested in, in Ukraine being able to uh, continue to uh, provide some level of integrated air defense. Um, that, that's a much uh, easier capability, I think, to integrate. Um, it's, it'd be fun, fantastic for them to operate uh, Russian-produced systems because, quite frankly, the Ukrainian defense industry um, at, at one point prior to 2014 was, in, what, in many ways, the heart of uh, uh, Russian industrial capacity. And, uh, of course, that's not like it was then, but they, um, they not operate sophisticated uh, uh, Soviet bloc or Russian bloc uh, uh, equip equipment and um, integrated air defenses are, are really scary stuff for anybody that's in the air. And uh, quite frankly, the idea of sort of a no-fly zone, if you want to achieve that operational outcome, uh, ensuring that the Ukrainians have the ability to um, implement an integrated air defense system um, would probably be the best step uh, to take. So uh, that's what I'd like to see uh, happen. I think the MiGs are more visible, more exciting, um, probably less uh, operationally um, feasible or um, would be less coherent in terms of achieving the desired outcome. And with that, how could allies go about giving that kind of air defense without pushing too far against Russia? Uh, I mean, this, this is a certainly a, a, a diplomatic game at some level as well, right? I mean, we're, we're clearly supplying, it's no secret, uh, the uh, the Ukrainians. And I think the Russians would uh, certainly would have, or and I'm sure can, would continue to, to enjoy to have uh, a more visible uh, presence by NATO in the U.S. just to support the narrative that that has, has been long developed in Russia, that NATO is oriented on um, somehow harming Russia. Um, and I think we're very keen to <clears throat> avoid giving um, Putin and, and the Russian regime that that opportunity. So um, that being said, um, the physical movement of, of, of weapons into into theater is something that logisticians and tacticians have to solve, and it's it's a hairy business. Um, and I, I don't I don't know the details, but I know it's um, it's just like planning a road trip. Uh, you know, with your friends or family, you got to think about routes and speed and balance speed versus security, and um, decide who's going to be the individuals at the border. <clears throat> whether U.S. Uh, and NATO personnel steps, step foot into um, uh, Ukraine is, is one of those detailed questions that uh, planners, I'm sure, are losing sleep over at the moment. And uh, no doubt we have, you know, a, a X number of people inside of, of Ukraine um, and, and under sort of a, enough co of a covert cover to uh, not acknowledge that politically. But um, I'm sure the instinct is to uh, have the Ukrainians um, take possession of these systems at the border or in some way that provides political cover um, and demonstrates good faith on our part that we're not trying to escalate this into uh, NATO-Russia conflict. And shifting a bit to some more diplomatic or some even say symbolic measures, we've seen some broad movements from the international community to officially recognize Russia's actions as war crimes, with many activists calling for the International Criminal Court to get involved. Does this actually mean anything for Putin on the global stage? Yeah, I think it does. I think we as Americans, if our going back to George Kennan and the long telegram and his sort of um, which many students at GW would be aware of, right? His, his, this was his attempt to characterize um, the Soviet Union in the 1950s and uh, or late 40s and, and prescribe a, a solution, which was effectively the U.S. and its, its system of liberal demo democracy and market capitalism should be the best version of itself. And, and you know, sort of in accordance with that is a focus on the, the value of the individual and the whole Western sort of 
um, uh, legal tradition, philosophical tradition, moral tradition. Um, and Putin cares about the reputation of Russia. He cares about its positioning in international organizations. Um, the uh, uh, a consensus opinion in the General Assembly, uh, which is underway at the moment to sort of condemn um, Russia's behavior, um, does does matter to him. And Russians are not completely cut off from that information. So I think it um, it certainly does matter, and I think it's important for us to to continue to uh, emphasize um, the importance of values. And we talk about NATO as an alliance of values first, first and foremost. That even when we can't use NATO's collective military power, uh, we we can use NATO's collective uh, demonstration of, of of liberal democratic values. And um, these kind of uh, pr pronouncements, regardless of our inability to sort of uh, enforce them in any meaningful way in the near future. Um, really take advantage of, of the, the strategic um, comparative advantage the U.S. and NATO have in respect to Russia, which is um, we are attempting to live up to the, stand, the, the commitments in these international agreements on the U.N. Charter and, and others, and, and, whereas Russia clearly is sort of cynically, um, <clears throat> uh, their, their, their behavior is quite cynical. And following up on that, if an ICC trial were to happen, would you expect something to actually come out of it against Putin or Russia's military leadership? I think you probably have folks who are more qualified than me at uh, GW to, to answer one of those questions. But I'll tell you from the having sort of lived through operationally the, um, the conflict in Yugoslavia and the Balkans, right, and the eventual sort of bringing to justice of various figures uh, uh, in, in that conflict, um, the hard part here is in, in, is enforcing international law, right? Because somebody would argue, right, that it doesn't exist if it can't be enforced and there's no supranational entity to do that. So we're, we're a long ways off from that. And uh, I think one of the takeaways here from this conflict is going to be, unfortunately, um, that nations that have nuclear weapons um, are able to um, reside in a, in a relative sphere of, pro of security um, because it's, in effect, sort of a supranational club. Uh, that those that have nuclear weapons can be free of attack, uh, such like Ukraine, who, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, right, in the Budapest Memorandum, uh, gave up their, their nuclear capability that was legacy from the Soviet Union. It's not clear they could have maintained that anyways. Uh, but um, we saw North Korea supposedly test uh, an ICBM today. And uh, the question sort of is, uh, how do you bring to, to, to court um, a, a, a foreign leader, a political or military, from a nation who has nuclear weapons uh, seems to me uh, uh, such a distant prospect that I have a hard time imagining Putin in the dock unless Russians bring him there themselves. And you also brought up nuclear weapons a couple of times, and this was something that we touched on last time. How long do you think it'll be before Russia res resorts to low yield weapons uh, like you spoke of? I wouldn't project how, how long it would take till they, to, to, to the use, but we have seen, if you're tracking, you know, all statements that, that refer indirectly or directly to the potential use of nuclear weapons, we've seen an uptick in that. So Lavrov reiterated the idea that if Russia's threatened existentially, I think is the word he used, um, that they, they have that capability and they would use it. And this is, this is nothing new. It's certainly in their doctrine and public uh, doctrine, uh, but um I, I look towards a situation where we uh, see a war of attrition in Ukraine um, or Russian forces threatened en masse. We've heard unconfirmed reports that Russian forces around Kiev may uh, in pockets be surrounded. Um, if they face loss on the battlefield, um, and, and it's also uh, evident it is not easy to get out of a conflict, right? Um, it is not easy to remove your forces and say, well, we're going to withdraw to this, this point. Uh, that can be quite disastrous. And you can ask Napoleon and his withdrawal from Russia in 1812, uh, prior to 1812, rather, um, how well that goes oftentimes. So th there could be significant enough. Uh, I guess I would look for a moment where battlefield losses are across the theater um, and, and Russia is threatened with significant um, defeat across large formations that uh, they may uh, up the rhetoric and make it very clear what they intend to do and add specific criteria for that, which to, to date, they have not very intentionally. It's very vague and ambiguous. Um, and, and that keeps us all on edge. But, but I can imagine a scenario where they say, stop, things stop right now, um, or we, uh, we, will, we will seek this solution to resolve uh, our dilemma. 
Thank you so much. And I think for our last question, we wanted to, to ask, is there anything else that you think is important for the public to know about this conflict? I, I, I'll tell you what I tell my students every class, and I, I sound like a broken record intentionally, is that we have to sort of, this is an opportunity to step back. And what we can see is the arc of Russian political, um, I don't want to use the word development or, or, or progress because that implies that it's gone in a positive direction, um, regression, quite frankly, recently. But <clears throat> much of the, the behavior, the performance, uh, the decisions taken recently uh, uh, go right back to the lack of, of uh, rule of law in Russia, the lack of um, strong independent institutions, um, which leads to siloed decision making. And this is clearly an instance of, of really poor decision making. And if we were to compare it to the Soviet Union, um, quite frankly, this is a much more dangerous version of Russian power um, uh, because even in the late Soviet Union, and, and our, my students spent time doing a case study of Soviet decision making that led to their involvement in the conflict in Afghanistan in 1979, uh, that was a, a decision by committee and there was real consultation and it was dysfunctional. But by comparison, I think the, the contemporary Russian regime um, actually is much less efficient, much less capable. That's a low bar comparing yourself to the late Soviet Union. Um, but they've really made a mess for themselves. And that's, I think, largely because the political structure um, and political system in place in Russia uh, is very frail uh, and uh, has, has all power concentrated in, in, in the executive branch and maybe even one person. And uh, that makes them a very different entity than what, what we saw in, in the late Soviet Union. So uh, uh, to answer your question specifically, a comparison with, with Soviet uh, political power is is a bit off, and uh, this is this is a uh, uh, a different entity, and it's it's quite dangerous. Thank you so much, Professor Purcell, for joining us once again. As the situation develops, we will continue to provide the DW community and public at large with the most up to date information and expert input. So stay tuned for more coverage on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You can find all of those links in the description. For all of us at GWTV, I'm Emmanuel Dair Melado. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.